if the people go and see this movie and they remember it the next day, that is because there will be an alteration in gene expression in their brain. That can produce profound changes in people's brains. So every single person in the audience watching this film has a slightly different brain because they have learned somewhat different things. Eric! Here it is. Deep in the middle. The green, the dark green, and the lighter green is the hippocampus. We have reason to believe that memory is stored in here for a period of time. And depending on the task, it can be a couple of weeks or it could be years. is the glue that binds our mental life together. I mean, it makes it possible for me to remember what I did this morning, what I did last week, what I did six years ago. It is what allows us to get continuity in our lives. It's the essential feature of our mental life. Without memory, we would be nothing. the 1960s when you know I began and people began to work on the problem we didn't have the vaguest idea how learning occurs so the first thing that happened is that we and others were able to show that learning involves changes in how nerve cells communicate in synaptic transmission the next question is how is memory laid down and we were able to see that you could see on the level of nerve cells what you see in behavior there's a short-term memory and a long-term memory Memory is one of the most remarkable aspects of human behavior. Memory enables us to solve the problems we confront in everyday life by marshalling several facts at once, an ability that is vital to problem solving. In a larger sense, memory provides our lives with continuity. It gives us a coherent picture of the past that puts current experiences into perspective. The picture may not be rational or accurate, but it persists. Without the binding force of memory, experience would be splintered into as many fragments as there are moments in life. Without the mental time travel provided by memory, we would have no awareness of our personal history, no way of remembering the joys that serve as the luminous milestones of our life. We are who we are because of what we learn and what we remember. That's terrific. Thank you very much. So calcium channels in the presynaptic terminal, if you enhance that, 
Oh, I mean, he is the rock star of neuroscience. I mean, he was a pioneer in the field. I took a neurobiology class, and I basically yeah. lived with this book. I mean, look at the crowd. We're all waiting. They're saying we're at capacity, but we're just hoping that we'll get in. Oh, my God. Kendall was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in the year 2000 for helping unravel the secrets of the neuron and the means by which our memories are stored. And the result of that was his new book, In Search of Memory. All right, let's hear it from Brooklyn. I presume you're here to learn a little bit about what my science has been like and what my life has been like and why I decided to have the goal to write a book. So I was born in Vienna, Austria, to a sort of lower middle class uh, Jewish family. And there was no one less likely to have a scientific career than me, as I'm going to make, I hope I will make clear to you. Uh, in fact, the early years of my life were not at all spent worrying about science. It was sort of trying to pull myself together after the traumata of the first decade of my life. So Denise and I have been married for 50 years, and we celebrated our 50th anniversary a few months ago. We knew that we wanted to do something bigger, and we thought we would do it with the children and the grandchildren. Particularly Paul wanted to come to Paris and Vienna and show the children where we came from, our roots, our origins, in search of memory. I tell Paul all the time that I'm amazed because he is so much a better parent than I am. I was, I'm not an easy person to live with. If they le let you work, <laughs> you are easy, I think. Exactly. Well. Exactly. <laughs> the, the war started in 1939. My father um, was a Polish Jew, and he arranged for the mother superior of the Couvent Saint-Jeanne d'Arc to take my brother and I and to hide us. I was nine years old. My brother was four years old. Can you imagine how sad it is? Yeah. But my mother was hidden in the woods next to saint uh -huh. You know, this is a life and death situation. There are certain things you have to go through because you have to survive. I think what is really remarkable about this situation is that there were people like Yvonne that there were people who were willing to take a big risk in order to save children and to save Jewish children. That is remarkable. Elle nous a sauvé la vie. Voilà. On avait pitié de ces enfants qu'on prenait comme ça et qui, qui n'avaient aucune raison de les prendre. Quoi. Did the other girls know she was Jewish? No. No one knew it except the Mother Superior. And later on, you're going to see this, the escape route. She had a special escape route, and kids, the Nazis would come. They would lead her there, and she would get out. Where would she go? Into town. Oh, wow. But I remember that I really was always afraid that I was going to be found out, so I was afraid to talk. So. Hasn't stopped you since then. You <laughs> 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 Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Oui, c'est ça. Yeah. Yeah. Stay in front of it. Oui. Eric. Le souterrain, c'est là-bas? No, c'était par là, je suis sûr. Yvonne, nous avions vu ce souterrain. Oui, nous sommes venus ici. Il y avait un jardin, il y avait un jardinier. Avec... Ça, ça n'y était pas. Non. Mais moi, je me souviens de passer par là. Il y a non, une autre, ça, je, il y a une autre place qui est derrière. C'est derrière. Denise, get off. Oh, they're having fun. Okay. I want to try one more time to see who's having fun. When you remember something, you use many different clues to store it and then to recall it. 
And the better something is encoded in memory, the easier it is to recall. So if you encode the space as well as the objects in the space, then it is easier to recall. And often, you recall something only because of the space. Okay, Alors, this woman knows where the <laughs> underground is. <laughs> is it's <laughs> here. Let's go. This is really it. We have it. <laughs> Petra, I want to tell you something very important. Don't shoot, don't shoot. Uh, the key to the success of the candles, particularly Denise's success, is we never give up. So I'm serious. She drives you sugar. People say no to her and she goes on and on. This is a perfect example. How much room is in there? Yeah, okay. come out. And we're going to leave it behind for a couple of days <laughs> because it's whoa. Careful, uh, Denise. What do you say, kid? Uh, this this is fantastic. Our life has two overriding themes. One is that Denise's experience in hiding here in Kaur is a deep parallel because it's much more painful, but a deep parallel to my own experience in Vienna. But in addition, finding the subterrane, as you pointed out, Petra is going deep, and this is what one does in memory, personally and in studying memory. So there's a double symbolism. Your subterrane is symbolic of memory research. Mm -hmm. People had early described in the rat that there is a map for space in the hippocampus. She showed, you also see this in the mouse, and then she made a fantastic discovery, which she's going to tell you about, that the map only is stable when the animal pays attention and that she's going to tell you about. This is my collaborator, Josh Studman. Hi. Now we are going to tell you how we test how attention influences memory, especially here we are studying spatial memory. Here is a mouse in which we had implanted electrodes. It's the same as this. So the plastic covers the wires that go inside the brain. It's totally painless for the animals. The animals don't feel anything. It's perfectly fine. You can see here the animal is inside this arena. And the two lights that you see on the head simply serve to locate the position of the animal at any given time. And here, you can see the space where the animal is, and this is tracking the position of the animal and showing where each of these cells is firing. All neurons are electrical. Our brain, you know, basically works on electrical uh, signals and we can record those signals. On a symbolic level, this is how, you know, the brain talks. The principal cells fire when the animal is moving in particular locations of the environment and they sound like boop, 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 and then they stop. Boop, 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 boop and they stop. Can you hear it now? Can you start to recognize? In different colors, you can see different cells. By looking at where the cells fire in a space, you can see whether the animal is paying attention to the surroundings or not. questions that you choose are the ones that have to do a little bit with who you are, where you come from. It's a, it's a question of personality. I mean, we, that's sort of, you bring your own personal history and personal interests to the questions you ask. So you have that always funny, right? Where do we go? I think it sounds great, yeah. yeah. He says also your voice is very good. I have a gorgeous voice. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? Now. 
It is November 7th, 1938, my ninth birthday. My parents have just given me a birthday gift <laughs> that I've craved endlessly, a remote controlled model car. This is a beautiful, shiny blue car. There's a long cable that connects its motor to a steering wheel with which I can control the car's movements, its destiny. For the next two days, I drive that little car everywhere in our small apartment, through the living room, into the dining area, under the legs of the dining room table, into the bedroom and out again, steering with great pleasure and growing confidence. But my pleasure is short-lived. Two days later, in the early evening, we are startled by heavy banging on our apartment door. I remember the banging even today. My father had not yet returned from working at the store. My mother opens the door. Two men enter. They identify themselves as Nazi policemen and order us to pack something and leave our apartment. They give us an address and tell us that we are to be lodged there until further notice. My mother and I pack only a change of clothes and toiletries, but my brother Ludwig had the good sense to bring with him his two most valued possessions, his stamp and coin collections. Carrying these few things, we walked several blocks to the home of an elderly, more affluent Jewish couple whom we had never seen before. This is my mother, Emily Kandau. This is my grandfather, Eric Kandau, who I call Opa, who also won the Nobel Prize. Come on, stop that. <laughs> this is Denise, my grandmother. <laughs> Ich habe sie gefragt, wo ist die Severingasse? Ich, ich war ein bisschen verloren, es ist gerade hier. Und dann This lady lives in the house that oh, I live oh, in. Really? She lives in another night? Wait a second. And this bakery, Ritz was there. He was a famous Nazi. And he was the one that went into our apartment and took everything that we had. I said you were nine. No. After several days, we are finally allowed to return home. But the apartment we now find is not the one we left. It has been ransacked and everything of value taken. My mother's fur coat, her jewelry, our silver tableware, and all of my birthday gifts, including my beautiful, shiny, remote control blue car. It's exactly the same. You see, you come in. You see, I, I told you, you could see this little garden. Genau das Mit dem Christbaum ist es alles ein bisschen eng jetzt. We used this, the maid slept in the kitchen. She had a bed here. Where did you shower? Pardon? We didn't have a shower. So then how did you get We it? washed ourselves. There was a, a curtain that separated yeah. the, my brother's bed and mine from my parents' bed. Yes, we slept in the same room. Wie heißt die Frau, die über das Haus kümmert? Die uh, Concierge. Das war die Ebner, die, 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 die unten gewohnt yeah. haben. Yeah. She was a Nazi. She was in the first floor and she sort of took care of the building. But she died two years ago, right? She died a couple of years ago. Thank you very much. Sie sind so nett. Danke vielmals. Ich bin auch eine halbe Deutsche, die sind alle freundlich. Wieder schauen. Komm. I cannot describe to you in detail how a complex memory like my playing with my toy car is stored in my brain, but I give you a simple example. Um, we will speak about the hippocampus, a structure deep in my brain and in your brain which is critical for storing complex information about people, 
places and objects. So we're speaking about an object, a car, a place, my apartment. A signal comes into the hippocampus from the blue car, from the part of the brain that deals with vision, with perception, and it ends on cells in the hippocampus that end in other cells in the hippocampus, right? I'm enjoying this event a great deal. This is very meaningful to me. I activate a modulatory system in the brain, like dopamine or serotonin, that releases a chemical transmitter substance that acts to strengthen the synaptic connection. So now instead of having one terminal, I have three terminals. So now this impression is strongly present in my mind. When I think about it, the next day, a week later, a month later, a year later, this is now permanently imprinted in my brain because of the fact that it was so emotionally rich for me, so important that I've stored it permanently in my brain. I've altered genes in nerve cells. I've altered gene expression here. They've given rise to growth of new synaptic connections. And those synaptic connections, under appropriate circumstances, can persist throughout my lifetime. That's it, kids. So we're going to Philadelphia, we go the library. To Philadelphia, and we're going to the free library. Is that what it's called? Yes, sir. Tell me, we want to make it coherent. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Like everything else. Uh, uh, Bye. Uh, How long do you think that should take? That'll be two hours, sir. Good. But no longer, huh? Yes, sir. We'll have a chance to meet two wonderful friends of mine, Mickey Stunkert uh, and Aaron Beck. Mickey Stunkert has been my friend for, I don't know, 30 years. He has a background in neurobiology. He's very much interested in feeding behavior. Uh, and Aaron Beck is a giant in psychiatry. He's probably the most important psychotherapist since Freud. How is Denise, by the way? She's doing great. So we're collaborating for the first time together. Uh, that's great. Yeah, it's really a very exciting thing. What are you doing? Uh, you promise you won't tell anybody? Just <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Denise has developed this idea that there are stages in drug use. Is this, you know, socially determined? Is it that once you start with one thing, other things become more? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or is it biologically determined? So we're doing this in mice. Oh, how fascinating. We're doing this in mice, and we have preliminary results that are very exciting. That suggest that it is biological. It's gorgeous. It's very, very nice. <laughs> well, maybe this prion protein is involved in it. Oh, no. So we have no idea. Oh, have no oh my God. We yeah, that's that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> so this is lots of fun. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is the way science is done. People get together. <laughs> that's how the coffee in, houses are in Vienna. Vienna. In, this in, is how, in that's Vienna. Vienna, that's right. The intellectuals would sit around and they would plot revolutions. <laughs> We're not smart enough to plot a revolution, so we do science. <laughs> <laughs> I think the marriage between psychotherapy and psychoanalysis on the one hand, biology, has to occur. I think these disciplines don't have a future unless, number one, they show that they work, and after a while, how they work. Your wife uses the gym all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. This is the most behind the I knew how to put electrodes into cells. Most people at that time in mm -hmm. neurobiology didn't know how to do that. So I thought maybe I would find out how the nerve cells of the hippocampus work. I would solve memory in a very short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> and within a month or two, we succeeded in getting electrodes into the hippocampus and we heard the boom, boom, boom of action potentials in the hippocampus. No one in the world had ever done this. We were euphoric. We danced around the lab. We were just ecstatic. Two incompetent kids had made a major advance in science. We felt very good about ourselves until we suddenly asked ourselves, what did we learn about memory? <laughs> we learned a lot about the cell biology of these cells, but they did not speak of memory to us. I realized that my strategy had to be 180 degrees different. Rather than looking at the most complex form of memory in a complicated animal, I had to look at the simplest possible memory in a very simple animal. I had to make the job easy for myself. 
This is called in biology reductionism, making the job easy for yourself. And I looked around for a, an animal that was appropriated for making the job easy for myself. Now, how do you make the job easy? You need a nervous system that has very few cells and yet is capable of generating a number of interesting behaviors that can be modified by learning. So I focused in on a marine snail, a plesia, that has a very modest nervous system, only 20,000 nerve cells in the whole nervous system. Moreover, what is remarkable about the snail, a plesia, is not only the very few cells, but each of the cells is gigantic. They are the largest nerve cells of any animal. After a while, people who specialize in certain experimental animals begin to resemble them physically. And I think in some degree, you know, psychologically, I feel that this was a marriage made in heaven, a scientific marriage. Because even now, as you will see over the next few days, I learn an enormous amount about the Plesia. I'm eternally grateful to Plesia. It is a match. These are the Plesia collections. And what you'll see is that they're about three different sizes. That weighs almost a kilogram. The average animal doesn't spend more than a couple of weeks here before they're harvested for cells. You can see these large stringy masses in the bottom of the tank, those are eggs. It's not letting, me... oh, there we go. It's starting to ink. So that's pretty much their only defense is ink. It's incredibly thick and it's this beautiful purple. Can you look at the stop says a map? I think we're getting at too soon. Much too soon. We are going at much too soon. No, no, no. I'll call the next one. Kuchka Gassen, Kuchka Market. Denise is not the next one. This is the next one. You're crazy. No. Denise, you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. The next one's going to be in the park. Sure. Well, you may hear. This is the market. We're hoping. Yes. This is the Kuchka Mark. My father's store is a little bit further up on the right-hand side. It may not be easy to find. Is this a street? Yes, it's a very small store. Uh, Ich glaube, mein Vater hat früher ein Geschäft hier gehabt. Wissen Sie, was früher gewahren war hier? War ein Spielwarengeschäft hier? Es tut mir leid, Jahre. kann ich Sie nicht helfen? Die ja. Chefin ist hier oben. Da Grüß Gott, es ist mir eine Ehre. Herzlich willkommen. Ehr. Danke ja. für Ihren Wein. Kommen Sie, Sie stellen Sie ja, mit ich mir. Ich habe einen Kunden, Moment. And she remembered that it was your father who understood? She said she's honored to meet me. I don't know why. Oh, wir haben schon so ja. viele Kunden hier. So viele Leute, die das Buch gelesen haben, die stehen hier und schauen und dann erzähle ich ja. She yeah. said so many people have read the book. Come, come here. Come here with the book. I Ja, und die Tür müsste noch original sein. Ja, und ich, ich glaube das, ja. Mit, ja, mit dem ja, Hausherrn ja, ausgemacht, ja. das darf er nie ändern. Das muss immer so sein. The the have to be the same. Yeah. They wanted to be the same. Wir <lacht> haben hier ein, ein, ein Feinkostgeschäft, aber das ist manchmal eine sehr stressige Arbeit. Und jetzt weiß ich, warum es hier so erholsam ist, weil hier so ein, eben die, die, die ganze Atmosphäre von früher noch. Sie <lacht> sind so nett, das ist so <lacht> schön. Das hat mir so gefallen, ja, und ich finde es. Ganz entzückend, dass Sie herkommen. Aber ich möchte es Ihnen zeigen, wenn ich Sie möchte, hier. Let's go inside. Also, vorsichtig, es ist 
Wir haben heute Fischsuppe gekocht. Fischsuppe! Lust haben, lade ich Sie auf eine Fischsuppe ein. I like the shop very much and I like being with my mother here. You know, it's very nice. I think I told you before, my father specialized in Puppenschachtel. Yeah. And he also had these toy cars. The one that I got for my birthday came from this saw. You and I are having a conversation and we are influencing each other by modifying the structure of our brain by remembering something. This has enormous ramifications. If you think of psychotherapy, that you're creating an environment in which people's behavior can change, you might be doing this by producing anatomical changes. And in fact, people have not found this. They found that when you practice something, when you relive an experience, anatomical changes occur in the brain. <laughs> Look in the profile. That's it. Okay. Look what happened to my father's store, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he would have loved this. My father would have loved this. This is with rum. Oh, you like? Uh, yes. And this is what? This is uh, uh, like a She's a very nice woman. Very. Very attractive. She speaks English very well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Darf ich auch? Darf ich auch? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. 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 Das ganze Buch und das Interaktion mit dir ist ein bisschen wie eine Psychoanalyse, nicht? Ich lebe wieder die frühere Experience in einer protected environment. Wir sind Partner in dieser Sache und wir sind beide sehr bequem miteinander. Und ich lebe wieder diese schweren Tage, aber jetzt bin ich älter, ich habe ein großes, ich habe mehr Kraft, ein bisschen verstehen, besser mehr verstehen meine Gefühle. Um, so geht es ein bisschen leichter. I used to play here when I was young. So we would go up here and we could play soccer here. Uh, there were slides, so we could go down slides and just throwing the ball. My parents worked full-time so we had a full-time housekeeper who slept in the apartment and she would take us right here until the Nazis came so I was uh, eight years old I would come with her or with my parents I would not come by myself Mitzi was wonderful she was the early woman in my life after my mother um, and I describe in my book that I had this remarkable episode with her which I will never never forget and I feel very warmly toward her. I see myself sitting in the bed. I was sick one time with a cold and she came and she sat down and she sort of uh, exposed her bosom, her breast to me, and sort of encouraged me to touch her. Uh, and I did and I felt a you know, wonderful sensation rushing through my body that I had not experienced before. And you know, we just embraced for a moment and then she said, uh, you know, we should stop. Uh, and I said, why? And she said, because, you know, if we go on, you will become pregnant. And I said, how can, how can a boy become pregnant? And where does the baby come from? Uh, and she said, from the belly button. And I said, how can that happen? She said, well, the doctor puts on a special powder and the baby comes out, the belly button opens up and I knew this was extremely unlikely. Uh, but nonetheless, I was worried. I mean, if I ever got pregnant, what would my mother say? <laughs> this so, is the original couch? The couch is in London. No, no. The couch is in London. From 1902 on, here met the uh, 
Vienna Psychological Society, the, the Wednesday, Wednesday, meeting. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday meetings. meetings. Very famous meetings. So this is a microtome. Now, Freud was a neurophysiologist. He did very fine sections of the brain. He was an extremely good neuroanatomist. Yes. These are nerve cells, and he was one of the first people to realize that the nerve cell was an individual unit. He also realized that nerve cells talk to each other mm -hmm. through connections. He called them contact barriers. We now call them synapses. But he had all of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Had he lived to this time, he would be a neurobiologist, without doubt. No uh, question. But also, as you indicated, he wrote two important works on the brain, one mm -hmm. on aphasia, mm -hmm. and then together with Ries, he wrote a book on cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Ries is Anna's mm -hmm. grandfather. Who's Anna Grace? A former girlfriend. A former girlfriend of mine. <laughs> and as Troy uh, pointed out, patients. sex is so mysterious. <laughs> we this out, right? Yeah. Look, in my lifetime, the biggest connection was bridging psychology to neurobiology. I had a small role in that, right? But that was the major event of my career in neuroscience. Of course, molecular biology came in to boost that along, but the big world change um, was bringing psychology and brain sciences together, the science of the mind and the science of the brain into one unified new science of mind, the new science of mind. It's a shame it's all covered up because if you stand here, you see the whole city. Can you see it? You see a view. This is also my Vienna because this is the art that I most love. Alle diese Male haben gesagt, sie haben nie Freud gelesen. Das ist nicht wichtig. Der Schnitzel der Freud, das war in der Luft die erotische Sache von Wien. Der Freud hat das nicht discovered, er hat das, er hat das nicht gemacht von seinem Gehirn, er hat das gesehen. This is Alma Mahler's Stepfather. You see the red is on the nose and the red on the cheeks. He brings out the man's inner values. These are pictorial versions of psychoanalysis, if you will. And as I was going along planning a graduate career, I began to be interested in European history. I wanted to understand how cultivated, intelligent people could listen to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven one day and kill Jews the next. And Ernst Chris, who was a really wonderful psychoanalyst, said to me after we got to know each other, you should do psychoanalysis. You want to understand motivation, you want to understand what drives people, you've got to understand the human mind. And so I decided I would take an elective in neurobiology. There was a very good person by the name of Harry Grunfest at Columbia. And I said, I'd like to find the local Kidalization in the brain of the id, the ego, and the superego. <laughs> and he looked at me as if I was Meshuggah. I mean, his eyes glazed over and he said, look, Bubby, if you want to understand how the brain works, you have to study it one cell at a time. And that was really, if you will, the motto, the leitmotif of my career. So right here, so you can see that these are connecting, if I lift this up, to this, this guy right here. Um, so this is a group of three ganglias here. I don't know if you can see that very well. And this is the connection that's involved in the gill withdrawal reflex. When the gill was, when the gill was tapped, it would withdraw its. So if I applied a weak tactile stimulus to a part of the body, I would get a withdrawal of the reflex. If the stimulus was unimportant, as I continued to elicit the reflex, the animal would get bored. It would learn to ignore the stimulus. And after a while, I would apply the stimulus, and it would not withdraw at all. If I bang on the table and I startle the animal, if I shock its tail and startle it, the same weak tactile stimulus would produce a very powerful withdrawal. 
but if you give five or more training trials, it will withdraw like this for weeks. It has a long-term memory. So I found that the skin of the snail has sensory nerve cells that make connections with motor nerve cells that move this organ, the gill, that I was looking at. So what we do is we isolate these neurons. What I can do right now, we can reconstitute them in a cell culture system and they will behave the same way if we apply the same sort of stimulus conditions that they encounter in vivo. What happens if I took the sensory neuron and the motor neuron out of the animal, a single sensory neuron and a single motor neuron, and I put it in a dish? Could I recapitulate the learning in a dish? So there are two that we want to pull out, two specific ones that we want to pull out from this entire batch. We'll use these, these very fine microelectrodes. And you can sort of push the neuron out very gently. This is difficult to do, and it's even more difficult to do with four people watching you. So you can see the axon emerging? Yes. You see some sheath still stuck to the cell body. And the axon has multiple branches. So what I'm going to do now is take this pipetter and I'm going to take this, this motor neuron and transfer it to the culture dish, okay? So he's now isolated one ingredient of the uh, circuit that mediates the gill withdrawal reflex. Now it's time to pull out the sensory neurons. But all I've done is I've used this microelectrode to force contact, a physical contact between the end of this axon and this stretch of the, the motor neurons. It'll take several hours or days to form stable synapses. I remember vividly when Hitler came into Vienna my brother had built a crystal set so you could hear sort of radio announcers announcing how Hitler first crossed the border between Germany and Austria. You could hear this background music. Die Fahne hoch, die Reihen sind geschlossen. Es armagiert sich die Welt in meinem Geist. So, man kann das Ganze hören. Und dann waren 200,000 Leute hier. Die Österreicher, they were just wild about him. The reception was just extraordinary. They fell over each other in greeting him. The experiment will start when you see the fixation point appear. The subject makes the association, the connection. I see the circle, and whenever I see the circle, something bad happens. Screams come, and it's scary. In the first run, we train them. They learn to be afraid only by the presence of the circle. And then in the second run, there are no screams anymore. We just show the circle. But they will react as if they would hear screams because they already made this connection. OK, Chris, you're all done. Okay. Great job. It's all over. So the next time he will see the circle, he will be very afraid. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so now I'm going to show you pictures of the brain activation. These parts of the brain in the amygdala became very active. The part of the brain that's involved in processing aversive stimulation, fear. So as you move through your life and experience different things, you acquire information about the world. And that becomes permanently encoded in your nervous system. parents had some friends who were not Jewish uh, and I didn't have 
you know, many close friends, but I certainly had classmates that I interacted with, uh, and they all abandoned us. No one came to help us. Nobody even said, you know, this must be very difficult for you. Uh, and this sheer abandonment was terrible, just absolutely terrible. It is difficult to trace the complex interests and actions of one's adult life to specific experiences in childhood and youth. Yet I cannot help but link my later interest in mind and how people behave, the unpredictability of motivation and the persistence of memory to my last year in Vienna. One theme of post-Holocaust Jewry has been never forget, an exhaustion to further generations to be vigilant against anti-Semitism, racism, and hatred, the mindset that allowed the Nazi atrocities to occur. My scientific work investigates the biological basis of that motto, the processes in the brain that enable us to remember. We don't go upstairs. Because a garden is here. I think the other way. She pointed like this. I think the word is like this. Hope of sky, man. So you found something? No, I found something. The synagogue was much larger than this. On the Kistallnacht, every single synagogue in Vienna was destroyed, with the exception of the central synagogue. This was the time that all the Jews were rounded up. It was a catastrophe. And when we got back to our apartment, we knew everything that had happened. All the stores had been taken away from the Jews. All the synagogues had been destroyed. Many Jews had been arrested. My father was arrested for a week. Uh, so we knew it was a catastrophe. Uh, and we could never come back here. We knew immediately that we had to get out, and we were just holding on until the documentation from the United States arrived, and we began to read about what America was like. And I remember my brother and I laughing. We had heard that when the Americans eat, they eat with their feet on the table, you know? <laughs> <laughs> somebody had seen a movie in which somebody put their feet in there, and we thought they ate that way. You see, how can you eat with your feet in there? And we laughed. And I remember my parents taking us to the train station, and we're getting onto this train. My parents were very optimistic always. You know, they thought this would work out. They tried not to frighten us. They also tried to protect us. Kurt Weiss took the same ship from Antwerp to Hoboken with us. Recently, he wrote me a note. Are you the same Eric Kandel that I met at the train station in April 1939? Well, yeah, of course, we were concerned. This may be the, the last time we ever see our parents again. Kurt is right. We were, I'm amazed that I was not more frightened, considering the fact that I was going across the Atlantic yeah. with just my brother. Yeah. My memory is beginning to fade, but your parents stand out so clearly in my memory. I remember um, his mother uh, uh, coming over to me, putting her uh, hand on my shoulder and said, well, you are the oldest one now. Take good care of my boys. And I said to myself, oh my God, I'm a 15 year old kid. I should take good care of her boys. <laughs> so I said, yes, I will. You were and you are a, Hi, Eric. A, a wonderful friend, and you have taken care of me even here. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure. And give my love to your wife and tell her I hope she continues to do very well. I shall. Good. Yes, I shall. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. It was just amazing what we did, absolutely amazing. And I have removed all feeling of fear from that, from my mind in that period. I've just repressed it, I guess. I remember the Statue of Liberty because everybody goes on deck to see the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, I realized it was the symbol of freedom. But seeing my grandparents and my uncle and aunt whom I'd never met before was perhaps even more significant for me. We felt immediately safe. I mean, once I got onto the ship, I no longer felt frightened. Um, so this was a 
not only the turning point, not only a turning point, but the turning point. You know, the Jews will never recover from the loss of lives during the Holocaust. Um, there are, without question, so many gifted people, more gifted than myself, that were lost. Um, it was an unbelievable tragedy. I, I don't think about them every day. I think about them periodically, but I don't think about them every day. The best I can do is to do the best signs. I think that's my usefulness. Susan? Hi, I looked for you this morning. Good. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Right, bye. I have to get myself into a temperamental Spanish mood for Juan Marcos. Uh, Juan Marcos is a wonderful scientist, and Juan Marcos found the partner of his life here. He had a number of very interesting possibilities and is going to go to Downstate, where there's a wonderful neurobiology community. So Juan Marcos, I'm proud of you. I'm grateful because you have never given up on me, and that's, that's a tremendous thing, <laughs> at least to my knowledge. <laughs> I have learned so many things from, from Eric, but I just want to rescue you one. The ability to communicate an idea is as important as the idea itself. And that's something that Eric has with 300%. And all of you, all 30 of you, made me feel home, away from home. And that's, that's something that I, I, I can never express my gratitude to it. Seven years ago, I stepped out of the elevator, and I was a totally different person. You have changed me. All of you have changed me. And um, for that, I will forever be grateful. Thank you. One, two, three, four, and you have three. He will arrive in the lab at, uh, in the middle of the day, and he's flown all the night, and he's been, you know, all over Europe in the last three days, and still he's, more focused and, and paying incredible attention to things. Uh, his energy is really amazing. I want to know, is there a pill? Because I'll take it, because it's, I don't know. <laughs> Could be fish, too. You know, I heard he only eats fish for dinner. So, bananas, fish, and yogurt, that might be the secret. <laughs> you can't think I know Bell. <laughs> I, <laughs> I haven't tried it yet, but soon. I might follow his footsteps and become, you know, as, as smart. The nerve cell has several different components. It has a cell body. It has extensions called dendrites. There is another process called the axon. This cell communicates with other cells. So here's another cell, and it receives information from this neuron, and we call this the synapse. What we're doing now is we're going to measure how strong the synapse is. And we'll do that by zapping the sensory neuron with an electrical pulse. And then we tell the sensory neuron, send information now. So we do that once. Keep turning up the voltage until the sensory neuron finally decides to uh, fire an action potential. What you see is when the sensory neuron does send information down its axon via the synapse to the postsynaptic neuron, what we see by this red trace is that the motor neuron received that information. This has been growing for about four or five days. The two cells touch and they start forming synapses. How do you turn a short-term memory into a long-term memory? What happens in the brain when you remember something for your lifetime? And we found that when you produce short-term memory, there was no change in how the synapses looked anatomically. All the changes were biochemical, they were occurring in the cell. But when you stimulated repeated training, when you produce long-term memory, we saw to our astonishment, there was a growth of new synaptic connections.
So this is a neuron, a sensory neuron, that we've put in a dish all by itself. It is programmed into these neurons to find a partner. That's what they do, that's their purpose, is to form a synapse to transmit information. So this sensory neuron would continue growing, sending processes out in all directions, constantly looking for a partner until it finds one. Once the sensory neuron finds its postsynaptic partner, it will send processes very rapidly all over that postsynaptic partner. And every once in a while, you can see a little swelling. For example, there in the green process, in the green sensory process, you see a little swelling. That's something that we call a varicosity. And the varicosity is the synapse. That's where the synapses are found. That's where information transfer occurs. What my work has shown is that the chemical synapse is the key to understanding learning and memory. The chemical synapse is not fixed. It is plastic. It can be altered by activity. In short-term memory, when you activate the system only once, you just increase the function, so you release more transmitter. In long-term memory, you actually turn on genes and you grow new synaptic connections. What you're seeing here is an example of the kind of changes that go on when we learn, when a new memory is formed. You have a pre-existing synapse that buds. It forms a completely new synapse. So this swelling gives rise to a completely new swelling. So that's the type of structural change that occurs when we learn. So short-term memory is restricted to the synapse. Long-term memory involves the nucleus, which now sends messenger RNAs to the synapses, and it gives rise to the growth of new synaptic connections. What you're seeing is a lot of the messenger RNA being produced inside the nucleus and then spilling out and being shuttled all the way down the axons. And that bright particle that's traveling down that axon is a bundle of a large number of instructions for how to make proteins. And then the synapse uses whatever resources it has available to it locally to take those instructions and make a protein. The target of doing all of that, of sending proteins down the axon, of sending messages down the axons, all of that is trying to accomplish one thing, which is to make that generate that. This is the end product. This is learning. Behind every one of those discoveries, there are just years and decades of very hard, very rigorous work. You work very long hours with the, the same people all the time, and we also often work weekends, many of us do, and so it's, it's more than a source of income. It's not for money. You're not going to make very much money in science. You're here because you have a passion, and whenever passions are involved, things are going to get interesting. But uh, you, know, you, you do have to keep in mind that everyone is here ultimately for the same reason. And we're all interested and incredibly fascinated by nature. And we want to figure out how it works. That's very important, certainly. Yes. I think we have our limits of, on frustration as well. But it's, uh, I think they're wonderful. But you should not be talking to me. You should be talking to them. I'm only making a public announcement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going swimming. I love the water. It symbolizes life. You think your daily thoughts. Sometimes I think what's happening in my life. Sometimes I'm mad at somebody. Sometimes I'm happy with somebody. But I try mostly to relax. That's it, folks. This is the house where President Kennedy lived when he was in New York. He went to school here. This is our house right here. It's us! Denise and I um, started to collect in around 1961, a few years after we were married. And over the years, we began to specialize, to focus in on uh, German and Austrian expressionists. 
I've been struggling all my life to come to grips with my Viennese heritage. Um, and so this is a further attempt to do that. One I particularly love is the kiss. It has meanings on so many different levels to me. It sort of represents the needs in myself. We were nice to each other, and I like it very much. The most difficult period I ever had was while I was a resident at Harvard. Um, so I would work during the daytime, and I would do experiments in the evening and on the weekends. Uh, so imagine you take your Saturday and Sunday and you spend in the lab and it's completely wasted, which is what happens 70% of the time. To drag yourself home on Sunday night after two days of failure and to have your wife unhappy about the fact that you were away for so long, that's very painful and very difficult. Shortly after our son Paul was born, in March 1961, Denise and I had a serious crisis, by far the most serious of our life together. I thought we had had an unusually harmonious relationship. She had strongly supported me as I was struggling to define my career, and she was working as a postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center. But one Sunday afternoon, she showed up as I was working in the lab and simply exploded on me. Carrying Paul in her arms, she screamed, you can't go on like this. You're only thinking of yourself and your work. You're just ignoring the two of us. I was startled and deeply hurt. I was so transfixed by my science, both enjoying it and also worrying about it when my experiments failed, as they often did, that it never dawned on me that I was neglecting or in any way devaluating Denise and Paul or withdrawing my love from them. I was upset and angry about being confronted so harshly and so suddenly. I sulked and pouted and took days to recover. In response, I decided to spend more time at home with her and Paul. Now you'll see the first place where I stayed. I hope the building is still there. I have not been there for 60 years. Um, my grandparents had already been in the United States for two months. My brother and I came in April, and my parents came in September. 11.15, so it's right here. 11.19, whoops. That's it. It's amazing how it's come down. Hi. Can we come in for a minute? I used to live here. How many bedrooms are there in this apartment? This is one and that one. Isn't there a third bedroom? I somehow remember three bedrooms. Yeah. I don't remember this layout. Even though there was a curtain over the doors, I could hear the prayers that my grandfather was chanting. Yeah. So conceivably, we were in the next floor. I remember a somewhat larger apartment. Hi, excuse me. Uh, I'm Eric Kandel. I used to live here many years ago. Can we come in just for a few minutes? And how does one get to the other side? It goes around? No. That's a separate apartment? Yeah. Is that a larger apartment? Yeah. Thank you very much. When we came here, we were at the same financial level as these people who were extremely poor. Hello. My father used to own the store that you own across the street, 411 Church Avenue. Yeah. He had a haberdashery store there many oh, years ago. Oh, that's a long time ago. Yes, Candell. I was on the avenue that time. You were already in the avenue. I was next to the pizzeria, next to the Tony. I didn't realize You remember realize that, that yes. this was a uh, yes. man's shop? Yes, I see, fantastic. So I think so, I, I know Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. And I remember when my father um, moved into the store, he had all the things at home, you know, what he was selling from day to day. And I would schlep them in order to help him move the stuff from the apartment to here. And then after a while, we actually moved upstairs, which is fantastic because, you know, my mother would prepare dinner, she'd just go upstairs, you know, and we'd have a bell and you could ring. The apartment runs like this. You come up the stairs and there are two entrances, one here and one there. 
But off here is a room, a single room by itself with its own entrance, a lock. And this was my room. It overlooks Church Avenue. And I really felt this was my little castle. Yeah, it was a small room, but it was very nice. My father actually came from Galicia originally. He was a very um, hyper guy, you know, like me a little bit, but more volatile. He would occasionally scream at customers if they didn't treat him right. And my father would not trust anybody. Didn't trust my mother. <laughs> because she would take money from the drawer. There's a drawer where you keep the money and give it to me. Anyway, they were very nice to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Nice to meet you, doctor. No, it's an optical illusion, but it's correct. That's the room. The room that's off by itself is, I'm almost certain, the one on the left. I could never bring any girls there, but uh, it was perfect. But um, I like this time of year so much, when it would get warm and I would hear the noises in the street that somehow buoyed me up. How long have you lived in this neighborhood? Uh, here I live seven, eight years. That's right. You're a youngster. <laughs> yes. <Thank> you. <laughs> I wanted to know whether you knew my father who had the store across the street, but if you didn't live in the neighborhood... No, I just was passing by. Okay. What store he had in his day? He had a haberdashery store. Long time ago? You're too young. You wouldn't know. That's <laughs> How long have you people been living here? Pardon me, sir? How long have you been living here? What is here? your problem? I have no problem. Uh, what, is, uh, what, is, uh, what is your explanation? Where? I just want to speak to somebody who might remember my father, but you don't remember my father. I probably remember, but I had to come back because I'm an old man. I'm 79 years old. You don't look like you're 79. Well, I'm 79. You're doing well. Well, God let me do well because yeah. I live for God. Yeah. Well, I'm, a, I'm born as a prophet. I see. Wonderful. I'm a divine healer. My name is Prophet Allen. You look good for yourself too, man. What are you, about 82? I'm 40. <laughs> are you funny? 82. <laughs> You rascal, for God's sake. 82. I didn't have to come to Brooklyn to hear that. <laughs> he's a character. Oh, my, he's, he's a character. That's your father? Father? I'm a lover. Father. He's destroying my reputation. My Some sort of a prophet you are. <laughs> Oh, boy, he's getting, getting a beautiful conversation in there. That's it. Now sit down. No, 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 no. I respect you. I respect you. I respect you. you also. You're a great respect man. respect you, all right? You're a great man. Peace and love to you. Peace and love to you. That's it. Ay, ay, ay. Pardon me. How long have you lived in the neighborhood? Seventy-some odd years. Seventy-some odd years. You're just the person I'm looking for. Pardon? You're just the person I'm looking for. <laughs> Why? Um, I used to live around the corner, and my father had a dry goods store, a haberdashery store. It was in, it's in the other side of the street. Do you remember that? I think so. I come from the other side of Brooklyn. We're reminiscing about the good old days. Were you here for the good old days? How long have you been living in the neighborhood? I've been living in this area a radius of uh, three miles. All my Sit life. Down for no, God's I'm going sake. up. I, oh, okay. had to, I had to take chicken out of the freezer. <laughs> take chicken out of the freezer. Did you go to the synagogue here? What oh, synagogue? Oh, sure, I still, I belong. Yeah, yeah we're not nice synagogue. members of the system. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Wonderful place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel a little bit hypocritical because I'm not orthodox in any way, but I feel culturally so uh, completely Jewish. But and to sit in the audience and hear a Nobel Prize winner speak is to be in heaven. And people understand that. This, Eric will never say this, but I will tell you, it's something so special. Let me explain to you why. Shh, shh, shh. No, 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 not for myself. Um, in the in a, in a Jewish um, value system, um, having a son, a scholar, is extremely important. Yeah, we value education. Education, an enormous education amount. Education to us is, is everything. Everything. These two are mm -hmm. called um, Rimonim, which in English really means pomegranate, but uh, it's also called Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. These scrolls are the trees of life. They hold our life. They hold Jewish life. Because what's written 
on the scrolls, on the papers, is the life of the Jew. In addition to the cover, you have several other things. You have the crown, and then you have the pointer, because when you read, you use it really to help you along. And you speak Yiddish? I understand Yiddish quite well. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I can read a klein bit, but I can read my Yiddish every day. Really? Yeah. yeah. Why did you just cry? I don't know. I, my crying is unrelated to specific events. They, they pull up some emotion to me, my identity with Judaism, my asking for forgiveness. But you know I cry easily. <laughs> Yeah, but you cry always when, when it's about this. About Judaism. Hmm. Yeah. Schwarz is on a yid. Yeah. You don't cry because it hurts. It's, it's uh, emotional. No, no, no. It's, it's not. I don't feel pain. Hmm. I, it has an emotional meaning to me. And, uh, you know, being a Jew has been a wonderful experience for me uh, in America, but certainly being a Jew in Vienna was very painful. I was never for a moment considered giving it up, but one was keenly aware of it. But we're not, we're not going to have a successful analysis of my emotional... <laughs> no, no, but, no, no, but it's... Yeah, it's part of me. It is part of me. And so now we're about 1990, and time has come to go back to the hippocampus to really try to tackle more complicated forms of memory. And it, as it happens, I mean, the field did not stand still. People had been working on the hippocampus since Alden Spencer and I began it. A lot of progress had been made. And just briefly stated, we found that in the hippocampus with complex forms of learning, like space or objects that mice can learn, the principles were very much the same. And what made the mouse so wonderful and continues to make it wonderful is mouse is like us. It's a little furry mammal, a person. And you can begin to look at animal models of brain function. Mice do not show Alzheimer's disease spontaneously. You can put into them the human mutation for Alzheimer's disease, but they develop on their own an age-related memory loss. If you take 100 people, 40%, everybody in this audience functions like they were teenagers. This is called euphemistically successful aging. The other 60% have one or another kind of tsurus. 30% go on to a mild disorder called age-related memory loss or benign senescent forgetfulness, non-Alzheimer age-related memory loss. And the other 30% go on to a very severe illness that you know about called Alzheimer's disease. So I look at their brain and I see that the synaptic connections that normally get strengthened with long-term memory don't get strengthened. And this cyclic gain P signal, which is supposed to go up, doesn't go up. Based on what I've told you, we raise the level of cyclic gain P. The mouse, not only the physiology, but the behavior returns back to the adolescent level. So if you're a mouse, we can do a lot for you. People, we're not sure you. <laughs> so together with several colleagues, I started a company called Memory Pharmaceuticals. This company now is in clinical trials with this and a number of other drugs, but our company is not alone. Everybody and his uncle is trying to get drugs for this. Moreover, Mike Chelansky next door has put an Alzheimer gene into a mouse, as have done many other people, and he's found that the animal has a memory loss, that the facilitation that you normally see is depressed, and you lose connections, anatomical connections. You give this drug that boosts up cyclic gain P, and you reverse much of that. So we're looking for the rabbi. Is he in here, or is he next door? Um, for a young, that's young Israel. This is Yeshiva Plaza. Okay, we want Which the one? Yeshiva Plaza. Okay. Okay. Good to see nice you, to see The schoolyard, I remember particularly well. We played there all the time. And this is my time. This it's is Jim. me. Uh, oh, my goodness. And this is Danny Newman. <laughs> Bravo man here. Rather ineffective, nice man. Marvin Leichtone. There's Ernie Bogan. Ernie Bogan. We sang Hebrew songs. 
Oh, what's your connection? Oh, oh, I've forgotten all of that. So we we learned Hebrew songs and we considered ourselves as people who might someday go to Israel. Um, oh, absolutely. This was very important here. Big emphasis. Uh, what was not discussed at all was what was happening in Europe. The Haggad Yidin was never mentioned. You really are not more words. When, when it's killing Jews, it's a Jewish expression. What was this? The Yidin. The Haggad, to kill. Oh, the Haggad. The Haggad. I'm sorry, it's my accent, my Viennese accent. <laughs> You're not an amorous, you're just a German Jew. <laughs> when you're doing your research, do you sometimes feel like you're playing God? No. Or you're coming close to discovering no. some of the secrets of... No, uh, no, 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 no. no. no it's, you're a shoemaker. You're really making no. shoes and you want the product to be nice. I see religion as providing some moral boundaries for my life, uh, providing uh, a bonding between members of the Jewish community, which is extremely important. Uh, some opportunities for my family to get together. And also, I, I like the history. I like, as we talked about before, I like what Jews stand for, by and large, the central values. I'm not an Orthodox Jew, but if I were an Orthodox Jew, I see no conflict between religiosity and even a belief in God and science. They're two separate worlds. See, for example, Jews don't believe in an afterlife. I mean, there's a conflict. It's not a clear view. Uh, so many of the issues that come up, you know, the soul, uh, the neshama, it's not a real conflict for many Jews. It's no conflict for me. You know, f most Jews, when you're dead, you're dead. You want the memory to go on in the identification of other people. You ever think about death? Uh, uh, periodically. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to it, but, you know, I have to face it sooner or later. Yeah. And what do you think what comes after death? Nothingness. Nothingness. This is a good example of how a presynaptic neuron, labeled in green, finds its partner and then sends its axons growing all over its partner. How is this growth stimulated? Now there's reason to believe that doing development and maybe even doing learning, there are growth factors like hormones secreted by nerve cells that stimulate growth. And there's been indirect evidence in Aplysia that a primitive growth factor exists. And believe it or not, little Stefan has not only discovered the growth factor, he's discovered the receptor for it. This little boy from Bulgaria came to my lab without any shoes, without a shirt, and look at him now, having discovered a growth factor. It was a very happy day of my life because uh, we looked at some sequences. Actually, I was sitting on the computer. What you do is you send out uh, what your data is, and then you get the sequence, and then you read it. And when I read and I looked, I immediately re realized that this looks like the one, the one that we were looking for for so long. It was very much like falling in love, but uh, and then uh, looking for your partner, but then this partner would not respond, so I even began looking for others, you know, because there were other growth factors we knew exist, even though they were not quite what we were looking for. But then it came in the last moment when I was about to, to give up and, and move on to a different project. So it was very dramatic, yes. This is it. Basically, this is the growth factor. You can see it in this movie now, moving inside the cell. The protein is invisible like itself, so we dress it with a green shirt so that we can see it, and we can see how very nicely it's uh, trafficking around. And to know that inside our head, we have exactly the same occurring at this moment. When we thought, when we are singing, when we move, it's like what we have here is a representation of what is going on in our heads. I think it's amazing, it's beautiful. This was such an unusual discovery. I thought we should break open a bottle of champagne. It's the first time in my whole career that I drank champagne on the discovery in the lab. This is even for, for a New York City high school to have something like this. And look at this. You know, for the Christmas concert, it would be completely packed. So we would sit up there in the balcony.
I couldn't have asked for four better years here. I really felt I came into my own. And then to have Mr. Campaner uh, facilitate my application and my going to Harvard, it's just a life-changing experience. Um, when I was close to graduating, uh, Mr. Campana, my history teacher, said, where do you plan to go to college? And I said, uh, Brooklyn College. And he said, have you ever thought of Harvard? And I said, no. And he said, well, why don't you apply to Harvard? And when I asked my father about this, he said, look, we've already put out the $15 to apply to Brooklyn College. There is nothing to be gained by doing this for Harvard. Uh, and I came back to Mr. Campana, and he said, here's the $15. Why don't you apply to Harvard? Uh, so two of us out of a class of, of 1140, 1,140 kids who graduated with me in June of 48 uh, got into Harvard, and I was one of them. And, you know, Harvard is not a bad place. It's not Brooklyn College, but listen, you've got to get an education someplace. <laughs> My hero, he's a very famous lawyer. The reason I go with him is you never know when you get into trouble, you need a lawyer. <laughs> Since the, uh, the Bush administration seems to want to criminalize dissent, if he starts dissenting and opening his mouth, who knows what's going to happen to him. So, so, oh see my god, I have a birthday present. Oh, that's beautiful. You look terrific. Oh, yeah. All right. season and we've been doing it for maybe 15 years and then one morning I'm sitting there at home opening up my newspaper and lo and behold I see that my tennis partner is one to know about prize <laughs> I was like I mean I knew he was a heavy-duty researcher but she whiz. on the day of Yom Kippur October 9th 2000 I was awakened by the ringing of the telephone at 5 15 in the morning the phone is in Denise's side of the bed so she answered it and gave me a shove in the ribs. Eric, this call is from Stockholm. It must be for you, it's not for me. Erik Kandel's work has shown us how these transmitters, through protein phosphorylation, create short and long-term memory, forming the very basis for our ability to interact meaningfully in our world. When I got off the phone and told Denise what I just learned, she was pleased to learn that I'd won the Nobel Prize she then said, look, it's early. Why don't you go back to sleep? Are you kidding, I replied. How can I possibly sleep? This is very beautiful. I mean, my life was pretty wonderful before then, but it changed it dramatically, yes. It's a great privilege to get the Nobel Prize. This is one, I love this picture. Incidents that both my brother and I are in careers that are very distinct from science. I work with women who are being abused in their intimate relationships and try and help them so that I can continue that struggle for justice um, and also in some ways, you know, pay back the debt 
that I owe for other people helping my family survive. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, may I have your attention, please? We commemorate the Seda in a number of different ways, including a Seda plate. So first thing is the roasted egg. So egg is for a new life. It symbolizes spring, the season in which we have Passover. Next we have the karpas, or the parsley. Allie, remember what that's for? Anybody else? <laughs> and she doesn't remember. Okay, so a horseradish and romaine lettuce are both um, symbols for the same thing. Who do you want to know? Bitter. bitter and why bitter? Because we had a bitter life in Egypt. That's right, to remind yeah. us of how bitter it was to be slaves in Egypt. And the Egyptians oh. turned them into slaves. Right. Not to worry, this happens in every Wasn't me. It's a Denise's favorite table. Don't worry, Denise. Now, one more little comment from this Haggadah, which is particularly relevant <coughs> to you which is the importance of asking questions for Jews and for scientists. So um, Isidore Rabi, the Nobel laureate in physics, was once asked, why did you become a scientist rather than a doctor or lawyer or business person? And he answered, my mother made me a scientist without ever intending it. Every other Jewish mother in Brooklyn would ask her child after school, no, did you learn anything today? But not my mother. She always asked me a different question. Izzy, she would say, did, did you, you ask, ask a good question, question today? today? <laughs> that difference, asking good questions, made me become a scientist. That's wonderful. Nice. I love that. Ich habe mich sehr gefreut, wie ich gelesen habe, dass du im Scientific Board des Institutes for Science and Technology Austria mitmachst. Es ist sehr wichtig. Für ja. Wien ist es wichtig, für, 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 für Europa, ja. wenn das weitergeht. Wir warten hier jetzt zusammen. Okay. Bundespräsident ist noch beschäftigt. Oh, ich habe Zeit. So. Wir begrüßen uns hier. Der Bundespräsident hat es viel leichter für mich gemacht. Ich war hier letztes Jahr. Wir haben das äh, Nobelpreis-Symposium gesprochen. Well, I think it's an amazing uh, completion of the circle to be kicked out of Vienna and then to be welcomed back by the leaders of the Austrian government and by the city of Vienna. It's uh, ironic on the one hand, uh, somewhat satisfying on the other. Uh, it's healing. It's healing. It's very healing. That's a very nice way to put it. It's very healing. This Kunsthistorische Institute, Deutsche Berlin-Theresia, schaut dir an. Die arme Frau sitzt dort. Es ist so kalt jetzt und sie sitzt dort. There is, I think, in every Viennese Jew, uh, a strong ambivalence. On the one hand, a tremendous hatred for the way we were treated, um, but a a love affair with Vienna, the city. It is a fan, for me, a fantastic city. I like being here. I love the physical beauty. I love the music. Every time I hear a waltz, it sort of lifts my spirits. This I must tell you. This music is so corny, but it gets to me. I, I can feel terrible, but I hear one of these Vienna waltzes. Or I just... Cheers me up immensely. Zu meiner freudigen Überraschung ist es mir mit diesem Buch aber auch gelungen, hier in Österreich 
die Gehirnprozesse der jungen Generation zu stimulieren. Und ich möchte Ihnen nur als Demonstration ein Beispiel zweier besondere talentierte Jugendliche vorführen. Dieser Film, den Sie nur sehen werden, erreichte mich ohne Vorwarnung vor drei Wochen in meinem Labor in New York. Film ab, bitte! This winter, we had an exciting time. Although there was only little snow, luckily, we had plenty of stimuli for our minds. We chose to study the brain during our spare time. Candel described how he made a brain out of clay when he was a student. We liked this idea straight away. First, we started to build neurons out of plasticine. Although we've been learning a lot this winter, we had fun in the snow. Whoever thought that our studies in winter time would end like a fairy tale such as Sleeping Beauty. Dormant messenger RNA is our Sleeping Beauty. She is kissed by CPEB Prince Charming. At the end, awake Sleeping Beauty Messenger RNA is creating new synaptic life. We still enjoy the winter time. Hier sind Anna und Martin, zwei fabelhafte, kreative Schüler. Und zwischen den beiden bin ich als Lehrer. Wie der Zufall will, ist diese Schüler-Lehrer-Interaktion auch eine zwischen zwei Nichtjuden und ein Jude. Mein großer Traum ist, dass eines Tages junge Juden wieder nach Wien kommen werden, eben weil das Leben in Wien so interessant, so angenehm und von besonderer Qualität für alle geworden ist. Und so könnte es geschehen, dass vielleicht wieder jene Atmosphäre entsteht, wie Anfang des letzten Jahrhunderts, in dem Juden und Nichtjuden einander gegenseitig intellektuelle Bereichen und so Wissenschaft und Kultur in Wien zu neue Blüte gelangen. Ich spreche von der Bewunderung aus, dass sie die Kraft aufbringen, da zurückzukommen, wo ich mir so viel angetan wurde. Ich, ich bin mehr und mehr bequem. Ich danke Ihnen. Leute wie Sie, die Irene, die so wunderbar ist. Ich habe eine ganz andere Reaktion jetzt zu Österreich als früher. Sie hat mir wirklich gehört. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Ich danke Ihnen. Ich danke Ihnen. Danke. Ich danke Ihnen. danke. danke. I think I told you that both my parents were extraordinarily impressed with my brother's intellect. They thought I was more attractive. I think they thought I was less brilliant and more attractive. My father thought that um, I would go to Hollywood. And here I am, 